Welcome back to the 10 Adventures podcast. For many people, their adventure is incomplete without their dog, but it's not always simple to bring your dog with you. So today I'm excited that we have Krista Howling, co-founder of dogpacking.com on the show to share her knowledge around how to have incredible adventures with your pooch. Hi, Krista. Welcome to the podcast. Richard, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Uh, I'm super excited to learn more about this because uh, I've seen some people that have, you know, really robust setups and some people that kind of have nothing. I've seen dogs get, you know, attacked by porcupines in the middle of the backcountry. Uh, and they, I just realized there's just a lot that can go wrong when you take your dog on a trip. But before we get into that, I'm really interested. You founded dogpacking.com. You know, what was the goal when you started that site? Yeah, so that was about a year ago, the... Um... The genesis, the idea of it um, came up. I'm a veterinarian when I'm not outdoors doing things with my own dog. And at the time, I was looking for a way to bring my little mini golden doodle river along with me on a bike ride because I'd pictured a, a bike being sort of a, a selfish decision. You can grab your bike and go and do something or you go do something with your dog. And um, and I thought, well, maybe I can combine the two. Maybe maybe she can come along. So I Googled how to bring your dog on, on a, a bike trip and up came... John and his his border colleague Mira and John and Mira are going around the world by bike. They were cycling all seven continents. Mira will probably hold off on Antarctica, but yeah, this is a multi year adventure for them, and they're basically the the gurus of how to get out there with your dog. And so I reached out to John and introduced myself and thanked him for the inspiration of how I can now bring River along. And John and I got to talking, and I was asking him the the uh, logistical aspects of bringing a dog along. And he was asking me more kind of a medical, how much can can dogs exercise and how to figure out Mira's nutritional requirements. And all these questions came up and we were answering them for each other and for ourselves. And then we realized, I mean, let's face it, especially since COVID, more people than ever before demographically are, are getting out there with their dog and want to bring their dog along. And so there must be more than just the two of us that have these questions. And in fact, John, through his social media, he's been getting a whole lot of questions by people who want to take their dog along and do do something with their dog. And they've got questions for John in the exam room. Um, I do mainly orthopedic surgery and uh, physical rehabilitation of dogs. So my owners, they like getting out there with their dog and they're asking about how much activity can they do and such. And we realized that there actually is not a, currently a dedicated website with ideas and science-backed information on how to get out there and do things with your dog. So we figure, well, let's spit out our brains onto dogpacking.com and and hopefully help more people realize their, their dream of getting out there for a big adventure or even just going around the walk and how to do that safely. I love that. Such a great story of how this how this came together. For people that maybe haven't done an adventure with their dog, what are you know, what are the benefits of, you know, including your dog on, you know, a great, you know, a great outdoor adventure? Yeah, there are so many. Um, and I'll start maybe by defining dog packing so people have an idea of what we're talking about. I think when people think adventure, for many people, they're probably thinking something pretty grand. And so I, I don't want this to, to sound like it's above the threshold that your listeners can, can potentially do. Like what the way John and I define it is, you, you grab a pack, you grab your dog, and you head out beyond your front porch. Like, and then and then you choose your own adventure. You fill that in with with anything. And so, to answer your question, when we think of that as more of of a lifestyle, of like now um, looking at your life through a lens of how about bring your dog along. And then the benefit then is now what you're doing, you're opening your life up to more outdoor adventure, and you're opening your dog's life up to more out outdoor adventure. And that fosters that connection between you and your dog, more so than sitting on the couch watching um, Netflix reruns with your dog, getting out there and actually now doing a purposeful activity with them, regardless of what the activity is. That's just the third thing that that prompts you to get out there. Um, but really, it fosters that connection. And it goes both ways. The dog is now more bonded with you. You're more bonded with your dog. And then you get the, the additional benefits people can probably think of, which is physical activity benefits to you and your dog, keeping um, the cardiovascular system healthy, keeping, keeping weight off. There's a big overweight dog epidemic um, out there that's that's in North America, it's in Europe as well. We're just used to dogs being a bigger version of themselves. And so they they typically eclipse what a normal body weight 
would be for dogs. So it really benefits them to to stay active. And then the mental stimulation of, of being out there and doing an activity and connecting with nature and the same with the dog. Now it's it's day-to-day life has a lot more going on and it helps it with being social. So we've listed a whole lot of, um, of science-based benefits. If people want to read more, they can go check out our website. But yeah, there's just so many advantages. In addition to the fact that it's just plain fun to have your your friend along. You know, what a nice time to get home and your, and your friend came along with you, right? <laughs> I, I never thought of the benefits for like the dog owner, but that's a really great point that if you, you know, make this part of a habit, not only is your dog getting all these benefits, you know, obviously there's the bunny, but you also get the health benefits because you're being more active. You're going out and doing things. Um, so it's like a double, it's like a double benefit that, you know, it's helping both sides. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and synergistic, probably more so than if you, if you went and did an activity and your dog went and did an activity and then you kind of met afterwards and chatted over, chatted over a beer about it. <laughs> um, you know, now you, now you get the additional bonding, right? Cause they were part of that activity as well. Like it's just such precious moments. Really, really fun. And are there some favorite uh, adventures or dog packing adventures that you've done with your dog that you think are just like, oh, this was such a great experience? Well, I'd say, I mean, at, at the risk of standing like I'm, I'm uh, excusing the the question or sort of getting out of it. You know, some people say their next adventure. Really, anything I'm currently doing is at the time the most fun thing because it's it's new. And even if the activity we're doing is not new. The day is new. The time of year is new. The you know the wave condition. If we're doing a water activity, is different, or the trail looks different than the last time we were there. And it's just it's super fun. And we have the benefit. You know the these experiences get stacked on each other. So when we head out, now it's like the upteenth time that my dog and I are going and doing something right. And so you just get this fabulous tight relationship um, that uh, is just super fun to do. But and if you're looking for like a more specific answer. The, uh, I guess two come to mind. One was the, the activity that my dog and I did that taught me the most in the most concentrated way. You know that learning curve when like life likes to teach you a, a lesson? <laughs> and it's fun to get to the other side, but maybe in the moment it's not. And that's when, when River and I did our first um, bike packing. So with a dog and a bike and touring, uh, we met John and Mira, who are super seasoned veterans. They've been cycling together for for years, for all of Mira's uh, six, almost seven years. And we we met them in Colorado, which is certainly a little bit higher than than sea level Ontario, where I'm, I'm maybe maybe 301 feet on a, on a good day. Um, so yeah, we were doing a six-week bikepacking trip together, and here comes the new dog packer. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a, a gong show from the standpoint that a heavy loaded touring bike gets quite wobbly when it goes slowly. And when it has somebody on it that pedals slowly, that creates a slow bike. And then you have a dog on there as well. And as the bike goes super slow, as we're going uh, tackling these hills at altitude that I thought I had trained for, but really you can't train in Ontario for, for Colorado. It's just, I'll just, uh, spoiler alert. Um, so I showed up and I was pretty new at this and river hopping out of the basket when we're going slowly and hopping in when we're going faster. And I'm watching John and Mira do it. And they are so well oiled. Like it looks so beautiful. They're just like synchronized, synchronized gold medal team. And then river, river and I can't keep up with them even on a, you know, even if John had two flats and still be faster than I am. And, um, I'm trying up the hill and the bike's getting wobblier and wobblier and river's wondering, why is this going so slow? So she's looking out one side, looking out the other side, and this is tipping. This is tipping the bike even more. So yeah, we had to abort and go and, and hopped on a in a car and went to um, to Montana, where at least it was lower. Still had the hills, but lower altitude, and then we continued our ride there back toward Canmore. Um, but what I learned from that is maybe not to introduce a whole lot of new things plus dog at the same time. I think if I were used to um, to going uphill at altitude on a loaded bike. And then the only thing new was the dog. That probably would have worked out a little bit better, but I just I threw all these new components at the same time. So that was certainly a great learning experience. Um, yeah, pretty memorable. And then, and then the other fun one was um, recently in in Cozumel, Mexico, we hired a surf instructor who normally instructs humans. And um, yeah, he agreed to like, okay, well, let's see if I can teach a dog. And he made no promises, which I laughed at because I had no expectations. Of course, he can't make a promise that this is gonna <laughs> this is gonna go well. But River already likes water. She already likes paddle boarding, so she's used to being on a moving board in the water. And then we're just curious, of like, let's see if she can surf. Oh yeah, she can surf. She can surf better than I can. And like, this is one lesson. So that was a lot of fun. 
Uh, that's great. That's great. I've seen videos of guys on uh, surfing with, you know, they've got the the oar with their dog on their board. I'm always like, that looks incredible. And yeah. I always assumed it was just, you know, years of training. But it sounds to me like maybe dogs are better surfers than we are. They're used to kind of, you know, four legs and moving in, you know, uneven ground. Maybe they have a natural affinity for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're sort of like the hang 10. They're kind of like hang, <laughs> hang 20, right? So they, they have four legs all on deck at the same time. And I usually do too, because I can't stop, stand up when I surf. So I'm, kind of, <laughs> I'm usually crawling on the board as well. But yeah, they just have that adherent uh, lower center of gravity. And I'm not taking away, River, I'm not taking away from your performance. It was stellar. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think they, they have that, which intuitively makes, um, makes it a little bit easier for them to learn. So I've seen lots of people in the backcountry with their dogs on backpacking or hiking expeditions. I don't think I've ever seen anyone dog packing with a bike. Can you maybe describe the setup? You know, is it like a, one of those chariots that's attached to your bike or are they going beside you? Yeah, that's a great question. So for those who can't picture how one would bring a dog along on a bike ride, the um, uh, I mean, the quick answer is the dog's not the one pedaling. You can probably figure that out. So, <laughs> so then we have to figure out where does the dog go? Is it running beside? No, it's kind of long. It's a long time for a dog to be running. And so where does it sit in the bike? And that's what I was wondering as I was Googling and ended up finding John and Mira. So there are a couple of options depending on the size of the dog and um, and your bike setup. If you just want to go the, the the easy, quick entry route, it's to take your existing bike, assuming you have one, or if not, get a, an inexpensive bike that is suitable for whatever terrain you're looking to do and attach um, to a kid's chariot, like a trailer. There are some for dogs and the ones for dogs have different weight requirements and, and uh, abilities. And also um, they load the dog a bit differently than the kid. And there probably isn't a space for an iPad and the one for dogs. But um, so you can look at that. But honestly, if you just want to get started, get whatever bike you have, whatever dog you have, and and um, a little trailer that comes along behind. And then, and then start with that. And the way to start them in the trailer is to get them used to probably the trailer indoors. So that's one way, just have it indoors, um, maybe remove the wheels so it's not tippy as they move in it and just have it as a little, like a surf crate. Like they head in there and they have a snack and they head in there and they hang out with their toy or they watch TV in there. And then um, and then attach it to the bike and get the dog ready for that. And we've got a few techniques that show this on um, on the, the dogpacking.com website. But effectively, that's one way. They could be behind you in that. The other way is that they're on the bike. And so there can be some form of basket that is either um, mounted on a rear rack, depending on the size of the dog, or that's um, in a front basket. Like as your dog gets pretty small, it could be in a front basket that, that can work. Or it can be on some cargo bikes that actually have, it looks like um, it looks like a bike that's pushing a, a shopping basket. Like, a, you know, the shopping carts? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Got one of those. Yeah. The dog could be in there as well. So there are a few ways for it to come along. And the idea generally is that um, for the dog to get some exercise as well, generally they run along the side when you're going slowly. And, and for me, that's a lot of the time, or at least when <laughs> I'm going uphill, then I'm going more slowly. So there are two advantages. One, the dog now gets some exercise of trotting along beside you and not at a speed that is that they're trying to keep up with a fast moving bike. The bike's trying to get up a hill and it's going slowly so the dog can keep up with that. The other advantage is if you're already sl struggling and going slowly as you go up a hill, you do not want your dog on the bike as well. Like <laughs> it's the first thing you want to boot out. <laughs> what what could I quickly unload? And then, um, yeah, and then when you get to the top of the hill, if you're going flat or if you're going you're flat and fast or you're going downhill, then the dog hops back in and, and off you go. It's so fun. Uh, I realized my dad was an innovator in, in dog packing because in the 80s, we had this little uh, terrier poodle that was, you know, pretty small uh, dog. And he got uh, like a, a woman's um, flowery uh, front handlebar basket. And we'd go riding around Calgary with our little dog Skippy in that basket. But the problem was she kept trying to jump out. And so uh, I realized we never got her used to the basket. So she kind of didn't love it. So we'd go on these long bike rides and it was kind of one hand trying to keep her from jumping out. But uh, it was actually a ton of fun because she just kind of sit there looking around and uh, we'd be able to go out and do something fun with her. And she'd at least get out of the house for a little, uh, it's almost like a car ride, only slower. Oh, that is awesome. Kudos to you guys for, for doing it. And we say you know, for dog packing before dog packing was, was a thing, but really we're just we're just putting a term to something that people have they've been doing things with their dog for ages, but more people than before want to get out and, and sometimes if you if there's a term associated with it, it's a little bit easier, a bit like like CrossFit. 
people have been doing weights and lugging things around for ages back when, when, they were, when we were working in fields. Um, but now there's a term for it. So at least that's how we use it, just any activity that you're heading out there and doing. And then that's just it. If if your dog, um, if, if her only association with the basket is oh, I'm not quite used to it yet, in I go and off and off we go on the bike, then that might be a bit unfamiliar. But if you get her used to, I love this basket. Now, where's the basket and I going? Then, you know, you probably have a better experience with her not trying to, uh, or not, not trying to press the eject button. You shared some great tips already about, you know, the bicycle-based dog packing around, you know, get comfortable yourself doing the trip, you know, get your dog comfortable in, in the basket or the, um, the, you know, rear attachment. Uh, we've talked a little bit about... The physical aspect that it's it's probably not going to be as stressful on dogs as it's going to be on you having to you know pull a bat you know a trailer and and a dog are there other aspects around bicycle based dog packing you know maybe i'm thinking is it you have to deal with heat or other animals or other things that for people that are just starting out you know some some tips that are um useful to know before people get started sure yeah so Really, any activity that you're thinking of of doing with your dog, whether it's let's go by bike or let's let's go camping or let's go um, traveling by by plane or a road trip or uh, a super fun hike or or trail running, all of those we we address. Um, for any of those, there's going to be things that get in the way of getting out there, right? The the unknown, like oh, I'd like to go and do it, but and so we've tried to address to address those those buts those. Um, things to get in the way. And typically it's like, I don't know what activity maybe a dog and I could do. We don't really have the idea of what we'd be good at or what my dog would be capable of or yeah, how much, how far can I go if I want to go hiking? How far can I take my dog? And what equipment do I need? And so those things tend to keep you from starting. So we've got a list of just suggestions for easy ways to just get out there now just to make it habit because once you've started then you can add to it like juggling just start with i don't know start with one ball i don't know if that's still called juggling if it's only one ball but but then you're getting started right and then add a second and then add add a third so along the lines of you know what i found tricky when it was new activity and the dog part um yeah that was that was a lot to deal with is a suggestion is even if you're thinking oh i'd love one day for my dog and i to do blah 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 if that's quite different from what anything you and your dog have currently done that might be a little bit too much of a stretch to do as as the next thing so what we suggest is start with something local a lot easier to plan something if it's just within half an hour of your house right then then if it's a, a bigger journey and start with an activity that you and your dog are already doing and the easiest thing is probably just is walking right like that would be a super easy thing and um just to get the habit of getting out there and use the, the existing gear you don't have to go and buy anything super expensive buy something used if you if you think you're missing a key component but if you get out there with what you currently have and just start making a habit and you know a few times a week even if it's half an hour every other day and just in your local ravine, for instance, um, you can take a 20 minute um, walk around the block and turn that into a 20 minute hike. Like that would be an easy exchange. And then beyond that, to increase activity, you just wanna go super slowly. We we give the specifics if people are interested in conditioning dogs and how much they can do on, on our website under the um, sports medicine and, and exercise. But effectively, you just wanna go maybe a little bit further or a little bit faster or a little bit harder terrain from one week to the next. You just don't want to increase all those knobs at the same time. You don't make it harder and faster and longer, which makes sense. So if you're wondering about what can my dog do, just look at what your dog's currently doing. If your dog can manage half an hour, great. You can probably do half an hour of something of similar speed and maybe slightly different terrain, if that if that makes sense. Does that answer your question or did you have a different angle? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's great. And it's funny, like that approach is if you're, you know, getting someone new to hiking or backpacking, it's the same idea, you know, don't start with some hard build up to it. Or even uh, with my kids, it was kind of like we've been building up because you don't want something to go wrong. And as you were talking, I was thinking, we mentioned uh, going for walks with your dogs. Every time, every year, a couple of times I'll see someone bringing their dog down in, in a backpack and, you know, oh, is everything all right? And, oh, you know, we're backpacking and he's just worn out or he's, you know, his, his paws are bleeding or he's, he's, he's eat, eating something wrong. And it's funny, like, I think people just think, oh, this is my dog. We go for one hour walks. Of course he can go and do a five day backpacking trip. But dogs are just like humans. Like if he's never done that or she's never done that before, it's going to be really, really tough. And, you know, if you're dealing with snow 
and cold weather or hot weather like we're getting now and then all the rocks like there's just so much that can go wrong sure i mean it's definitely possible to break a dog i mean i my, my whole career is putting them back together so <laughs> you know that, that that shows you it can happen but by and large if you sort of factor in those conditions and think of yourself is it is it going to be too cold is it going to be too hot and is what i'm about to do what i um an easy way to think of it or that i tell pet owners if you just sort of in, intuitively think is what I'm about to do with my dog likely to surprise my dog's body? And if you kind of picture what your dog's been doing day to day, you will have an inherent like, oh yeah, that's probably gonna be a surprise. And the same with us, just don't do something that's gonna surprise your body because it's ready for, it could do a, you know, a, a, a given difficulty using similar muscles, like a given activity, it's used to a duration and a difficulty of, of X amount. And if you suddenly, if you do a little bit more, no biggie, it's going it's to strengthen because of that. You've been training and now you do a bit more. But if you suddenly go from one kilometer to well, let's do five days, yeah, that's going to surprise the body. Or if you suddenly make it, we're going to, now it's going to be hot and we're going to go a lot faster. That's going to surprise your dog's body. So that's where things can go wrong. That's where things can get strained and sprained. Um, if the terrain suddenly changes a lot, and if you, especially if you've increased the the distance, then maybe the paws are used to um, are used to sidewalk, or maybe used to going around a, on a lawn, and now you're doing um, really really rough terrain, and you've just increased the distance by five fold, let's say, then that's where you're going to have paw injuries and a lot of abrasions and such. And so, yeah, well, absolutely, things can happen even with best prepared plans. Typically. If something's going to go wrong, it's just maybe um, often a little bit poor planning or maybe trying to do a little bit too much too soon. So just keep it conservative. And if, if you're not sure, stick with what you've currently been doing. And um, yeah, and then, just, and then just go from there. And keep an eye on your dog. They're not likely to text you. If they're behind, they're not probably going to like, hey, um, hey, can you, can you hold off? Uh, LOL. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm having trouble here. And it's easy to think, well, if the dog's kind of keeping up, it's probably doing okay. But if, if, if it's keeping up, it might just be because it's on leash and it can't drag because if the leash physically doesn't extend 80, 80 kilometers behind you at, or 80, 80 meters behind, right? And so um, if your dog is lagging and they're behind you and they're going slowly and they're kind of dragging, if the tongue sort of hanging on, on the ground, if they're panting a lot and even when you stop, they're continuing to pant and pant and pant, you're probably doing too much activity for them or it's too hot for them or you need to take more of a break. So just keep a really good eye. If the activity you're heading out to do is not too different than what your dog's used to, it's just a novel environment or maybe the train's a little bit different or maybe it's a little bit longer, you're probably going to be fine. But just, yeah, just keep an eye. Just check in with your dog and when in doubt, stop and take a break um, and see how see how they're doing. But they shouldn't be limping. They shouldn't have their tongue on the ground. They shouldn't be lagging, you know, dragging behind you. Then it just means you've you've done a bit too much, and so time to time to back off. So the next time you head out, go and do the distance that they were okay with, and just you know, then and then just gradually get back up to the one you were doing when it didn't go so well. Here in the Rockies, we have you know we hear lots of things about dogs' interactions with wildlife. I've seen dogs chasing herds of deer or elk. I've seen dogs who have you know messed with a porcupine. Uh, and then there's stories of, you know, dogs inviting bear attacks. And there's a really tragic case last year where they're unsure of the role of, of two dogs in terms of, you know, uh, what ended up being a fatal, a fatal accident for the owners and the dogs. And I'm wondering, what's your advice in terms of keeping your, your dog safe when there's, you know, wild animals around that are unpredictable? Yeah, this is a really good comment. And that's just said the, we say the wildlife is unpredictable, but to a certain extent, they're predictable in that, um, for the most part, they're not going to provoke an attack. They'll usually they'll usually attack in response to being provoked. And so probably the best scenario is, um, is, is common sense. That's an easy thing to say. But if you keep your dog on a leash, if you have excellent recall, because now and then dog won't be maybe in a campsite, you've taken off the leash for a minute. So have like nail in that the recall, dial it in, dial it in, dial it in. So that dog is even, and when you do the recall, um, a, a trader knows, can speak better to this than, than I can, but um, have it where there's distractions, distractions like another dog. So if you think, oh, the recall is great, but you've only ever tested it in a field where there's nobody else, then your recall is probably fine. You want to challenge the recall with when there's poor concept when there's um minimal consequence right just test it where if a dog breaks recall and, and runs to that dog it's a dog that you know but now you know that the recall actually isn't that good so just keep working on that because typically when there is um 
uh, an undesired encounter with wildlife, it's, it's the dog usually that provoked it. Maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally. They're curious animals. So typically, like porcupine quills, that ends up in dogs' faces. It's not the porcupine that was doing the chasing. Otherwise, it would be in the, in the butt of the dog. But it, it's in the face. And the same with snake bites. Typically, it's, um, it's the feet and the, and the muzzle that gets bitten because the dogs are investigating. They either didn't know the snake was there or they knew the snake was there and just wanted to go see the snake. And so the wild animals don't want us to come near them. So the best thing is you can keep your dog on leash, have excellent recall. And then the other thing that uh, command I use for River is leave it. So if I see that she's interested in something, let's say something has come to her. I've, I've got her on leash, for instance, but now there's something that's coming close. Leave it. And she knows to, to come to me and to just abort. So it's pretty rare that you'll be unprovokedly pursued by, by a wild animal. They just they don't really want to come near us. Um, and I, obviously, I can't speak to what happened to that, that horrible incident with the couple and the, and the dog. But yeah, typically, the dog does something first. So if you just have your dog under control, things are likely going to work out fine. I'm interested. You talk about having your dog under control. And uh, we were back in one, one of our trips backpacking last year. There were these two, I think they're called Rhodesian Ridgebacks. I don't know if they're still called that, but they were just straining at their leash. They were lunging at anyone that went nearby. They barked all day and all night. And I kind of thought, why have you brought these dogs to a backcountry campsite? Because like they had them in the eating area and you, you literally couldn't go, you know, go towards the river because the dogs were like patrolling it. And yeah, I've got three young kids there like, you know, straining on they're just on these you know, ultralight uh, ropes. And I thought, you know, sh- as an owner, should you, should you be going if, if your dogs are kind of not uncontrollable and the dogs didn't listen to the owners, should you be taking them into these environments or should, should you, you know, have, have some level of control beforehand or like, if you have a really protective dog, is it even the right decision to go on to, you know, trips like this where you're going to be in shared campgrounds with, you know, a lot of other people? Yeah, exactly. Well, back to what we we're talking about with those initial elements when you're picking an activity and what to do to to base it on your dog, like know your dog and what's probably going to work out well. And part of that is also your dog's behavior. There's just certain, there, there'll be certain things that are not a good match for your dog, for its stanima, for its... Um, ability to tolerate heat, and for how it is behavior-wise. And so in that circumstance, like that's, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, that that absolutely happens. And I mean, that's not fun for anyone. That's super stressful you know, for those even around. Even the dogs, I think. Like the exactly. dogs just seem so yeah. stressed out because sure. they were kind of on guard duty with, you know, there's what, 12 campsites, so probably 20 different people going around. And these dogs are just kind of going wild. I thought, oh, like it sucks for all of us, but the dogs aren't having fun. Yeah. No, for sure. They're, they're uber reactive and either they're on the offense or there's, or they're stressed and anxious and they're being defensive, but either way they're, yeah, clearly they're not relaxed in that circuit, in that environment. And it, it, I mean, we don't want to give too much sympathy to the owners who brought them along and created that, but the owners aren't going to have, be having fun either with dogs that are super reactive and, you know, they brought them along to go camping. Maybe they couldn't find a sitter and, and here's what's happening. So yeah, nobody wants that scenario and we want what's best for our dogs and we want it to work out for everybody. Yeah. So definitely the, the nice thing with, um, doing these outdoor activities with our dog is that there is that opportunity for socializing. That's much better than a dog that stays in the house all the time, but you want to do that in a controlled way. So if you know your dog is super reactive, then, um, then yeah, maybe work with a trainer or uh, a lot of YouTube there are YouTube videos by dog trainers that can help with very specific activities or you can check with your veterinarian as well that can help with behavior modification. But as you learn, and there may be, you do, you do your best and you didn't realize that your dog is um, has issues with thunderstorms uh, to the extent it does, for instance. Or maybe there's something that come up they didn't realize. Okay, well then you can, you can head back and work on that afterwards. But most people know their dogs and know what, um, what their triggers are. And yeah, if you can try to avoid that, you could start by heading somewhere where there just aren't going to be other people. If that's going to be a factor, but maybe rather than pigeonholing your your dog and your activities to areas that just don't create social encounters, probably using that as an opportunity to get them used to outdoor environments, get them used to other people, get them used to other dogs when they're not reactive. This is just it. Just it. You can you can normalize it, and um, it just makes it so much pleasant for so much more pleasant for everybody, including the dog, as we've said. And then if you go on a, a trip, uh, River and I have done a, quite a few airplane trips, and she's small enough to fit in, in the cabin under the seat. So we're in the terminal together. 
And I got her used to that, not by going to the airport and walking around the terminal, but by picking something similar. So she was in the backpack that she got used to because it was in the living room floor and it was just open. It was just lying there. I would put treats in there for her and she'd go and lie there with her toy and, and the backpack was her, her friendly place. And then we started going out of the house with the backpack and she just enjoyed being in it. And then we started going into stores that allow dogs. So what I'm looking for is something similar to, to the airport terminal. And so um, the specifics of what I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it only apply to people that travel by, by airplane, but just to say, picture the activity and the environment that you and your dog are going to be encountering, and then try to break up those components and get your dog used to those. So she needs to be used to the backpack in this case. She needs to be used to, um, to being busy and a lot of people around. She also needs to get used to people not coming up to the backpack and saying hello. Because I don't want it to, otherwise I'd feel like I had a popcorn machine behind me. She'd be jumping up and down trying to say hi to, to everybody. And that's just, that's not going to work too well. Um, so you start doing that. So again, I sort of looked at like, well, okay, maybe you don't have to drive into a, maybe necessarily drive to a, to a campsite or the campsite for this, but you can look at the different components. There's probably going to be people around. There might be loud noises around. There might be other dogs around. Um, do you have your dog under control? Is it, is it chill when those environments are happening? And to introduce them, you don't want to introduce them all at once. That's a bit too much, right? But you just, you break it up into components. And again, you can work with a trainer or maybe your veterinarian or um, some, some online videos on to how to get them used to that. So that when they see it, they're like, meh, meh, so what? And that's what you want. You want a dog that's like, meh, so what? <laughs> right? And not react. Well, it just makes it better for everybody. But now you've got a dog that like, oh, that's great. My dog doesn't bark anymore. Um, when people come along, my dog doesn't go bananas when they see another dog. Like not just for your dog packing activities, but really anytime you you leave the house just to run an errand with your dog, it just makes it so much more pleasant or if people come to your house and such. So there's so many benefits to you know using these little dog packing adventures to sort of to, um, to light a fire under under better training your dog and they don't have to like it doesn't have to be advanced training like um juggling or doing somersaults and things just just basic training is what we're looking for i think that'll go a long way you know it's so obvious when you describe how to get your dog to be comfortable in a backpack on a plane in an airport uh i know uh we we had a dog and we had to crate him to go from vancouver to calgary and he hated that crate and we did it all wrong because we just got this crate and put him in. He's like, I don't like this. What the hell are you doing? And then, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I feel kind of stupid that, oh, we didn't think about how we want to get, you know, spend a few weeks beforehand getting the dog used to it. It was like, oh, we won't bought a crate and put him in it. And he hated it. And, uh, he never liked crates after that. Like, uh, uh we did it all wrong. And it's so simple the way you describe it. I feel kind of stupid for doing it the wrong way. No, oh, I mean, that's a pretty obvious way to, to do it. But that's exactly why cats don't like veterinarians. Because when does a cat go in its little box? Only when it's going to a car ride to the vet. Doesn't like the box, doesn't like a car ride, because it, it ends up at the vet clinic. So if you do things that just have a positive consequence, exactly, you start with, hey, I would like you to enjoy this backpack or the basket, the rear rack basket that you're going to be riding in. Um, some of them, they're these collapsible ones, but often these little these crates come in in a, a pack of three. And the handy thing is that you attach one to your bike, if, if biking with your dog is what you're looking to do. And then the other one, you sort of, you bring in the house and put in a couple of areas in the house and, and pat it. And that basically becomes your dog's hangout. And so when I put her in the one on the bike, you're like, oh, this is, here's my basket that I just hang out in. And same with the backpack, if you're taking them around. And so, yeah, just get them used to all those little components. And then as they come up, it's, you know, you've, you've done well you've 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 won the game so, so i'm sorry to hear, hear that but it uh yeah the way you went about it created created the result that you saw that i was like oh i don't know what this is but oh and and, and i'm glad i didn't like it because i was right look what happened <laughs> um talking about about going on a plane and there's international holidays and we actually hear from a lot of people who are booking trips with 10 adventures can we bring our dog you know any tips you know they're coming from you know the united states they want to go to europe and that's kind of out of our area of expertise. So we say, oh, we have to check, like, you know, there could be laws to you know, take a dog into a new country and whatnot. You've talked a little, about, little bit about how to get them comfortable at least going on the plane. But are there other aspects if someone's going to be going on a, you know, transatlantic flight and wants to go on a trip in a different country that uh, maybe owners don't realize? Yeah, it could be a lot of fun to take your dog to different countries and get their pa passport stamped and such. But the, um, the additional things that probably are important to consider is probably start with the destination where are you thinking of going and just logistics aside just picture 
that area? Is it an area that has pet-friendly hotels or accommodations? Is it an area that has a pet-friendly way of getting from the airport to the hotel? Like even that part. And when you're there, can is it a hotel where you can even leave your dog? If you have to go and run errands, for instance, some hotel rooms or some hotels don't let you leave your dog in the room because they just don't want to be responsible for an unattended dog or one that's barking. So even those little parts of like, oh, even if we got there, okay, hmm, that wouldn't work out to spend a week the way we're picturing spending it. So yeah, look into that part and just make sure that all of that's fine. And then and then the aspects of uh, the travel, the tra- there's a travel component and then the international border component. I'll start with the border component. For that, there is export. So to go from one country to another, the same with us, but we'll look at the dog part. We're exporting the dog from one country and we are importing it. So two things are happening. And sometimes there are export requirements. Things need to be stamped and things need to be fulfilled for a dog to leave a country. And that's if there are things in the country that should not be taken out of the country, like parasites. And so the requirements to exit from a country may actually be different than to enter another country. So if you're looking at import requirements, the easiest thing is to go to the country that you're considering and go to their government website. That's what's going to be most up to date. We don't, on dogpacking.com, we've got logistics and under travel, we've got some some suggestions and directions and such, but we don't put any conclusive um, information there because things are changing. We don't know every country is, is different and they, they keep changing their own rules. But essentially the step is go to the government site and just see like importing, bringing a dog into this country and see what requirements and make sure they're current. They can change if you're looking at it for a year from now. Keep checking because they might update their requirements and might be different than what you started with on your checklist. And just make sure that your dog can fulfill that. There are certain breeds that can't go to certain areas that are banned. Um, and then usually it's uh, core vaccine requirements and anti-parasite requirements for medications for a certain amount of time. But yeah, the export and the import requirements might be different. And you need a fair bit of time. If something needs to be stamped by your veterinarian or printed out, don't call them that morning for, for a flight You know, the next day. And in some cases, government um, stamps are needed. So when we went to Costa Rica, for instance, the Canadian government needed to stamp her her uh, rabies certificate and her antiparasite medication certificate. Even though I'm a veterinarian, it wasn't good enough for, uh, <laughs> for me. They wanted you know they wanted some higher up. So it has to be stamped by the government, and that takes a few days for that to turn around. And then also to leave Costa Rica, we also needed to get export information for her. Otherwise, um, the um, the airline wouldn't even let us on, let alone let alone when we arrived going through customs, we couldn't board the airline without that being fulfilled. So keep an eye on that. That can change on a whim. Specifically now, because our audience is probably a lot of uh, Americans and Canadians, the the Center for Disease Control, the U.S., is imposing as of Octo- as August 1st of 2024, there will be new requirements, additional requirements for entering the United States with a dog. And so that's either someone that is entering for the first time with a dog or a visitor that's entering and then planning on leaving a gate, just visiting the U.S. with your dog, or someone who, uh, an American that has a dog, lives in the States, is leaving for vacation with their dog, and turning around to come back to their home country. Um, any dog entering has to fulfill, they have to be, yeah, they have to be over six months of age, they have to have a microchip, that's a, a specific type of microchip, and the microchip has to be in place before the rabies vaccine, so that the rabies certification says which dog it's for. It's for this microchip dog so that that can't be switched to a different dog. And then there's some documents that need to be done as well. And it's unsure yet whether the Canadian government, the, the CFIA, need to also stamp the paperwork now to get your dog to the state. That's still in process. So with only three weeks to go with with these requirements, um, that's still up in the air. So there's going to be a little bit of a bottleneck when this comes through because the CFIA says, the number of dogs that come and go from between Canada and the States, this is going to be, if we have to stamp this for everybody that's that's crossing into the States with a dog, this is going to be a bit of a problem. The other place it becomes a problem is there are a lot of um, specialty veterinary clinics, referral hospitals close to the border. And in some case, that's your closest referral hospital. And if you get referred, it used to be you could just hop across and go for an appointment or go for surgery, whatever procedure is needed and come back. Well, now this paperwork is going to be needed. Even if you come across for a quick procedure to Canada, you turn around, you're going to need paperwork to get back to to the state. So just it's a a matter of planning ahead. And then the other thing is to look at the airlines that you're considering before booking your flight. They do have requirements, um, specifications, criteria for whether a dog can be in the cabin, whether a dog can be needs to go in cargo, how that looks, what size of 
bag your dog would need to go in, what what are the weight requirements and such. And then um, and then if you go to book, best to call them so they can actually look and check that uh, rather than booking online and then just hoping that there's space for a dog. So yeah, so there's a little bit more planning, but boy, when you um, as I said to River, when we're <laughs> when we're um, enjoying a, a cafe on the French Riviera, she will thank <laughs> me for you know for teaching her to enjoy the backpack. So. Uh, those are great suggestions. And actually, one thing I was thinking of when you were talking is uh, I had a fellow on the podcast a couple of years ago and he walked around the world for six or seven years and he, he had a dog. And actually, I remember one of his blog posts, he was talking about how he had to go find a vet. And actually, he didn't I care it was in Uzbekistan or something or and he couldn't find someone that spoke English. And, you know, kind of my my thinking is you're more likely to find a, like a doctor for a human who's multilingual than a vet necessarily, especially in some developing countries. And so there is an aspect as well of having, you know, with, with Google Translate now, it's going to help. But, you know, five or six years ago, just being able to communicate with the vet is actually could be a challenge. So if there's something going on, you're trying to describe it, um, you got to think of, okay, how am I going to communicate? Okay, maybe maybe the person at your hotel can help. But uh, there's an additional challenge if, if you need help of just language issues. Absolutely. Language barriers can be a big one. I mean, I think these days, yes, Google Translate helps a ton. Although if it's anything like Siri, it gets a fair bit wrong. <laughs> that's, a, you know, that's a word that it's trying to translate. Um, but, you know, fortunately, a lot of veterinary words um, are lang- uh, they're, they're, uh, romantic or Latin roots. So a lot of the words are going to be pretty similar. So that might get you somewhere like doing and, and drawings, but yeah, that could be a big challenge. In touristy areas, um, the veterinary clinics, we've gone to them, they are used to having to fill out paperwork for foreigners that travel with their dogs. And so usually their uh, their English skills are actually quite good in, in uh, you know the, the vet teams, which I, I applaud because my Spanish is not that great. Like their, their English is far better. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly something to to keep in mind as well. And a um, quick story as we were returning of things that can happen when, or at least that we just didn't keep in mind here. I'm thinking I'm um, running dogpacking.com, so I, I better do this, right? And, that, and stuff come up. So River and I were returning from Costa Rica and um, to to Toronto, but we had a United flight and it stopped in Newark and then continued on to Toronto. So we show up and I looked at the export requirements. I looked at the import requirements to get back to Canada. And I show up and we, we were denied boarding because she, she did not have an official um, screwworm exam. So there's a parasite that uh, essentially it, 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 it's a fly that lays eggs um, that create little larvae, like maggots in, in wounds. Big problem for production animals that can really decrease production of, of cattle and such. And so if it gets to the United States, if it gets to Canada, that can be a big economic concern. Not likely to be on um, on a pet dog that's been traveling with me. She's not likely to have an, an unobserved an attended wound, but the uh, the issue was Canada doesn't doesn't require that, but the United States needs uh, documentation that a veterinarian within five days of traveling has examined your dog for evidence of screwer and and you're all clear. But I'm not going to the state. I'm going to Canada. No, I'm landing in New Jersey. So suddenly, if you have a connecting flight in another country, you need to fulfill all of the import requirements to that country, and then. The export requirements and the import requirements from that country to the next one. So yeah, we had to, we had to delay our flight and go find a veterinarian to to do this rush order uh, screwer and paperwork for us to just to return to Canada via the United States. Oh wow, that would be stressful. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit stressful. I mean, it's a it's a it's a privileged position to be in, like traveling the world with my dog. I can't really complain when these little things come up. Uh, and it created an extra blog idea for us. So you know, we, we got some content for the website, which was great, but it just, I had no idea that it never even occurred to me to look at, oh, there's a specific requirement for a dog leaving Costa Rica to enter the United States. And it's imposed by the United States. So the, the, the US government says to the Costa Rican government, do not let a dog leave if they have not, if they haven't filled out a, um, have a negative screw arm um, physical exam. So it really depends what country you're leaving and what country you're, you're going to. It was not on the list. It's not on the list if you look at what you need to get into the United States with a dog. It's not on the list if you look at what you need what you need uh, to enter Canada with a dog. It's only on the list of what you need to leave Costa Rica to go to the United States. Yeah, so it's the it's an export requirement, not an entry requirement. Wow. Uh, you know, Krista, this is, there's been so much information here that... Um, I never even thought of, and I'm sure there's lots of people who are wanting to do these types of adventures or travel with their pet, 
And I just want to say thanks for sharing all this knowledge. Where can people find more about uh, dog packing? Sure, if they're interested, um, specifically, I mean, if they'd like to come to our website, we'd we'd love to see them, like to hear from them. So we are dogpacking.com, D-O-G-P-A-C-K-I-N-G.com. And there we also have a weekly newsletter. It's easy to subscribe when you get to our website. There's a banner there to subscribe to our newsle- a weekly newsletter that comes out every Friday. If that's of interest, we um, have tips and tricks and um, some information that either reflects what we've recently posted on the website or just some new content. The one coming up on this Friday is going to include the seven spots on your dog where ticks like to hide. And so we just give information there that can help people get out there with their dog and have some fun, easy to unsubscribe to if it's not your thing. And then um, on social media, the main place to find us is dogpacking underscore call. Uh, I'm going to put links to those in the show notes. And uh, yeah, if you have a dog, it seems like it's a no brainer. All this information, expertise for free in your email box at once a week, uh, go into dogpacking.com and uh Yeah, start to plan these incredible adventures with your four-legged friend. Thanks for listening to this episode of the 10 Adventures podcast. We'll be back next week to explore the world and hear about more epic adventures. Start planning your own adventure by visiting us at 10adventures.com and listen to other episodes of the 10 Adventures podcast on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you find your podcasts.